The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. So today we're excited to have uh, Gagan and Ingrid and Hawken uh, from the um, from the Google and Apple team. Uh, so they're here to talk about a, a new database system they've been, uh, they've been building at Google for several years now. And there's a recent uh, VOD paper this year that describes the architecture. So we're really happy to have them here to talk about this, this, you know, this massive project that they've been working on. Um, so Jagan is, is part of the data infrastructure team as well as Andrew and Hakan. Um, he has a PhD from uh, University of Maryland uh, in computer science. And the Andrew is also on the Google Data Infrastructure team. And he has a PhD from UT Austin. I believe Hawken also has a PhD from UT Austin as well. So with that, uh, Jagan, the floor is yours. And then for the audience, if you have a question uh, while the speaker is, is giving the presentation, please unmute yourself, say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask a question. And feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be interactive so not, Jagan's not speaking into uh, the emptiness of Zoom for an hour. So with that, Jagan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, a new data warehouse product uh, at Google. Uh, we um, we've been working on it for many years now. Um, uh, many of the important uh, Google uh, uh, systems actually use uh, our data warehouses for their uh, analytical needs. Um, so um, as Andy mentioned, I have uh, Indrajit and Hakan um, in the uh, Zoom call. Um, let, let me also um, uh, tell you a little bit about the work they did um, with uh, Napa. Indrajit uh, is a manager in a group. Um, he's one of the um, uh, first members of Napa. And um, he leads the effort to build uh, the Napa controller and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, Hakan uh, is our senior director. And uh, uh, then the whole Napa team reports to him as well as many other teams. So um, the, uh, if you would like to grab a copy of a paper, we have it uploaded um, um, at uh, the Google research homepage. So the material here is covered in this particular paper. I highly encourage you to um, grab a copy, read it, and uh, send us your comments. All right, so a um, um, little bit about myself. Um, I am a tech lead at Napa. I work on uh, primarily on query optimization, uh, view maintenance, and view recommendation problems. Uh, in um, for many years, I worked at uh, NEC Labs before I um, I came to Google. Okay, having said that, um, let's get started. Uh, now, um, traditionally, what you've seen here is uh, data warehouses um, are typically built for these so-called white wheels. Now, uh, these are the systems with these uh, uncompromising sort of performance requirements. They want everything to be faster, larger, some freshness to be great, and things like that. So they sort of skew the design in a certain direction. Now, um, but if you uh, leave them aside and if you look at uh, the, the many other requirements that are there uh, inside Google, I'm pretty sure outside Google also, is that these there are many new clients that have fairly sophisticated performance needs, which are really hard to achieve. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. And this is the reason why we actually went back to the drawing board. We actually designed this new system called Napa uh, that is able to satisfy many workload types. Now, um, if you zoom out and, and look at it from, a, say, a thousand foot, um, the uh, data warehouse typically consists of a few boxes, right? I mean, no surprises here. Um, first of all, what you have um, are uh, three components of a data warehouse, which is an ingest, there is some storage, and then there is query server. An ETL pipeline brings in an enormous volume of data. In our case, it brings in these trillions and trillions of rows every second of the day. The way to think about it is at any minute of the day, every second of the day, uh, we have tens of gigabytes of compressed data actually coming into the system. So the, as far as the scale goes, it's a, the, the scale is like uh, is, is quite uh, extraordinary in some sense. Um, it comes and then it, it actually lands in thousands of these tables and associated indices. And then we are able to serve queries on thousands and thousands, uh, billions and billions of queries every um, single day. Now, what is important here is to really understand where our clients come from, right? So the clients, what they do is they actually build these dashboards, these analytical tools, these widgets and collabs. Um, and then they actually query the system using SQL. Now, these one thing um, uh, to understand here is that these are fairly interactive application. And the goal here is to actually serve these application using in, in uh, less than a second, a sub-second latency. 
right? So one very critical aspect of what we do is to ensure that we are able to answer these clients really, really quickly, right? Uh, for for the, the volume of data that's being ingested, the, the amount of tables and the amount of data we deal with, that's a pretty challenging problem in itself. But really, the one of the key realization that we had here is that latency is one aspect of things, but the real, um, what is very important for an interactive sort of application is uh, the being able to provide robust query processing. What that basically means is that the while the queries are fast, they should also have low variance in the response time. So it, it makes for a terrible user interface. If one query, say, it runs in 300 milliseconds, the other query takes three minutes, right? I mean, it makes for the, the variability basically makes uh, it for a really unpleasant user experience. Now, that is said, easily said than done for the mere fact that our workload um, uh, basically has these huge variations over time. Um, uh, day versus night, week, day versus weekend. Um, and uh, month ends, for example, are a very busy time for us. So as you can see, the 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 both the ingestion and the query workload that is actually put on the system is extraordinarily different and changes over time. And that is one challenge of it. The second aspect of it is that um, so uh, unlike these high performance data warehouse uh, vendors um, who typically require um, one to basically buy software and uh, associated high performance hardware. Our data warehouse completely runs inside Google internal cloud, which are basically general purpose heterogeneous machines. Now, um, the challenge there is that how do you tame variances when you are running inside a Google cloud, which is actually a multi-tenant environment? So that is the second challenge. Here. Right now, the most Actually, important thing. Quick question about the variance. Like, what is, what is the scope or the window you, that you look at various? I understand like you know one query after another. In, in succession, you want those to be sort of roughly written the same response time. But like, are you talking about like within a month, the same query has to have the same response time given a week? Like what's, what's the scope uh, you guys yes, consider? Or, or, or it's lifetime, it has to be similar, right? I mean, because you're okay. talking about clients that are running these critical workloads. Um, so, which basically means your 99th percentile and your 999 percentiles, they, they better be, don't have this huge uh, exponential jump. So, uh, being able to tame uh, tails is, is extraordinarily difficult. And um, uh, as I, I will describe later, later in the talk, we go through enormous effort to make sure that there are, the tails is abated. So, uh, the, and the paper, we basically talk about literally 50 things that we need to do to make tails go away. So um, okay. like tail abation, um, abating is, is a serious business that we do. Right, thanks. Uh, uh, hello, I have another question uh, following Andy's uh, question. Oh, by the way, I'm Yu Xiao from MIT. I'm currently a uh, PhD student. Uh, working daily basis. So, uh, so for requirement one, uh, you emphasize on the low variance in response times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I just want just want to understand the intuition behind why the variance is put before the absolute uh, response time. For example, is there? Uh, yeah, just wondering the exact uh, intuition. Um, so uh, I, I do have many slides on it. Uh, so okay, can I can I get back to you uh, after I presented those slides? It's it's later in the talk, but uh, we can talk. Yeah. About okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, is there a security concern, for example, like uh, to avoid uh, like timing attacks? Not, not, not really. I mean, uh, th this is uh, this is a data warehouse uh, uh, that uh, that people use to consume business data, right? So um, it, it, this is you make business critical decisions based on. Uh, what these data warehouses tell you, right? Um, the, so, and the user base is pretty much a, all of Google. Um, so, you what you want is basically people to be able to consume insights from data in a timely fashion. I mean, that is basically what is going on here. Um, the, maybe we can talk a little more after uh, I presented some of the later portions. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, um, the the second requirement, which is actually um, uh, qu quite um, quite interesting and and uh, ho hopefully a little surprising, is that the uh, one thing to note here is that um, uh, although we've written many papers uh, on, on on the extreme scalability of our systems, one of the things to understand here is that not every application that we write uh, needs millisecond uh, latency, right? And not every application requires minute freshness, and and most certainly not every application has unlimited data warehouse budget, right? You are talking about many uh, teams and projects and groups within inside Google um, that uh, basically um, are, uh, are trying to optimize their, uh, their business model. So uh, as the business needs changes, they come back to us and basically say that 
I want to renegotiate my contract with the data warehouse. I want to basically make the query slower or faster. I want to reduce cost. Um, I want to uh, change the freshness requirements and so on. So the challenge here is that now we have built this one data warehouse system with hundreds of these uh, clients uh, that actually use put their data inside Napa. The idea here is that how do you change this production uh, system to actually cater to these different requirements and also changing requirements it's because these things don't uh, are not fixed in stone a client could come back tomorrow and make a tweak to their expectation from the data warehouse and, and that's the challenge that napa is able to handle and to illustrate this point let me give you a few examples uh, that which will make clear where these needs come from now um, there is this cost conscious, conscious napa client they run an experimental framework um, they come to us and say that, well, uh, I'm, I'm cost conscious, which basically means that uh, obviously we need to control cost. Um, the, uh, I am willing to live with low perf query performance, um, and I, I can, I am, uh, I, I want uh, the cost to be reduced. Uh, but uh, but uh, the way what they wanted to say is that, can you give me these two things? You are to give me moderate uh, query performance, and, and the cost has to be low, but I'm willing to sacrifice on data freshness. So they're basically saying, let me trade off on data freshness, and let me get a couple of things that are beneficial to my user uh, needs. Uh, another um, client basically comes and says that, well, I run this fresh uh, data analytics application. Um, I'm willing to, um, uh, I, I, so the name itself says that my analytics data should be very fresh. But what I'm, what I'm willing to trade off is query performance. I don't need um, absolute uh, fantastic query performance. I'm willing to trade off on it. Can I do that, right? I mean, that is the second uh, kind of a use case. And obviously, um, you would have guessed by now, the third client is basically one of those external facing clients. They come to us and say that, well, um, I'm external facing. I'm critically important. Uh, my business case is very important. I want extremely good performance. I want good freshness. But can I uh, trade off on cost? I'm willing to pay a little higher cost. Now, as you can see, our clients basically come from uh, every end of the spectrum or every end of this triangle and, so, and everywhere in the middle. And they basically want to say that um, I, I want to trade off one of them. Can you give me the other two? And, and they do this trade off with varying uh, sort of um, um, uh, varying degrees in some sense. Right now. Um, OK, now, why is this hard? Right. I mean, why is um, uh, basically flexibility providing uh, client flexibility is hard? To that, uh, let's look at um, uh, a typical design, right? I mean, if you look at uh, designs out there, um, at a very high level, uh, we can go back and agree that data warehouse typically consists of three three such boxes: ingest, storage, and uh, query serving. And one of the things you can um, you can see here is that most designs they either couple ingest with uh, storage or they couple storage with query serving. Right. In, in the first design, uh, if you couple ingest with storage, uh, your ingestion can only go as fast as how fast you can index. So basically, what that means is that if you want great query performance, that is, if, if your indexing uh, load is very high, uh, that basically means that you have to sacrifice freshness. On the other hand, if you say that, well, I'm going to uh, sort of couple indexing with query serving, which basically means that you do them together or in tandem, then the problem here is that you would um, you can get great freshness, but then you have to sacrifice some query performance. So the it's almost like the, the 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 of course we know that there is no free lunch, but the choice here is already made for you. And in the next slide, I'm basically going to say what is a, at least intuitively how is Napa slightly different from uh, this this architecture I just showed you. Okay, now um, let's let's go back and um, and uh, let me uh, tell you why uh, how Napa is uh, different. Uh, going back to the same familiar three boxes in just storage, uh, storage indexing, and query serving, um, I already told you about the ETL pipeline and and the tremendous amount of data it brings in. Now um, the uh, one thing to note here is that uh, Napa uh, design is uh, planetary scale; it's highly available, and there are extreme amounts of fault tolerance redundancy built into the system. Um, so uh, in, in, in some sense, we can tolerate uh, multi-cell uh, data center failures and so on. And, and uh, uh, basically, it's, it's built to um, uh, tolerate failures uh, to a great extent. The sort of surprising thing about Napa is that we have sort of bet the bank on materialized views. Like our performance comes from materialized views. We build uh, hundreds, um, if not thousands, of materialized views on, on a per table basis. And the second thing is that these are absolutely consistent. A view is consistent with each other. A view con is consistent with this parent table. A view is consistent across data centers. And that is a very key part of Napa. 
the reason we we sort of uh, sort of insist on that is that we, the user should not have any query difference regardless of whether the query binds to a root table or binds to a view it should not have any difference whether it binds to one data center or the other data center it should not have a difference if i'm dropping a view on the user queries or if i'm creating a view on the user queries uh, the, this the, the the database so not, none of the database uh, state can reveal uh, that uh, a view even exists in the database system the user queries the base table and magically they get the speed up by binding to the right view now it is um, uh, in literature um, it is um, uh, it is fair to say that the scale of data uh, amount of data we ingest and the amount of tables we actually maintain and the amount of views on the tables and the consistency mechanisms we provide uh, basically makes us an extremely challenging problem that no system comes to mind that sort of pushes view to this extreme that we have actually done in terms of the volume of data and the number of views we actually maintain now moving to the query serving one of the things that uh, i want to point out here is that the key idea here is that we want to uh, provide robust query performance that actually avoids stales and offers subsequent latencies later you will see at least i'll give you a flavor of the extreme amounts we have to go to make sure that we are actually query serving and sort of do, uh, doing a tail evasion uh, in that okay now let me get to the difference now i've showed you the three boxes and and uh, the the thing that makes a difference which hopefully i'll convince you uh, towards the end of the talk is that we have actually decoupled the ingest from the storage and the storage from the query serving so what that basically means is that the ingestion goes as fast as it can okay up to some limits so as fast as the user can push it we can actually take it uh, till obviously it exceeds some limits that we actually put which are pretty generous the indexing is decoupled and it can scale up as much as the provision resources that is given to the indexing and finally the query serving this is an important point is that the one of the reasons how we are able to actually abate uh, tails is that the query serving does bounded amount of work regardless of the system and it's in, uh, and it's completely decoupled from indexing it is not very important to understand what that basically means is that um, right now because i'm going to talk about it but the key idea here is that regardless of the state of the system the query serving actually does a, a finite or a fixed amount of work and that is one of the reasons that uh, the napa is able to provide very consistent sort of uh, tail free um, uh, query performance okay now hey, uh, um, sorry i have a quick question my name is sure. uh, slim i'm software engineer at linkedin so uh, i want to double click on one thing so when you have the ingestion there as called an etl two questions here is that etl that includes like real time uh something like google pops up or that's like a batch job and the second question when you are ingesting does it model actual updates on a table or is it just only in append only basically kind of workload do you do, do you do any like updates on fields or it deletes or froze and uh, yeah that, that is the first question um, right so the, the pipeline is batch based yes um, and then uh, the in terms of data model uh, at least in this paper we only talk about um, append only kind of uh, the style workload uh, but uh, yes uh, yes so in this paper we just uh, deal with append workload uh, although it's uh, obviously possible to do also do other kinds of things uh, did i answer you yes i think you did answer the question so when you do uh, like an etl like how fresh is that data there right so the the it depends right again that is also has uh, as uh, as provisioning as uh, slas and there is an end to end latency and things like that so the whole thing is governed by an end to end latency of which we are a part of it right what what is like the best latency that you guys you can get i, I is, is that okay uh, there is an sla i mean um, indrajit you want to jump in say something yeah uh, i think i would point out that maybe it's best to talk about spectrum instead of taking what is the best that can be done, uh, because those are internal details. Uh, the paper talks about, and it's intentional why we're only talking about things that is written in the paper. Um, so the paper talks about things like order of minutes, for some folks who want order of minutes, some folks who are okay with larger amounts of minutes. Uh, to your previous question of, can we do streaming? Actually, all of our ingestion is streaming. Uh, what Chagun was pointing out, batch means that ETL pipelines may itself be of batch oriented. But from NAPA's perspective, it is actually receiving trillions of rows per day, and they're all being streamed in. Some of the upstream may choose to 
output data, which is more PubSub like. Uh, there's some smaller examples like that, uh, but the vast majority are slightly different, which is they have logs data, uh, which have been logged and they did some processing and then they're starting to stream into Napa. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Moving along. Um, so um, we, we talked about uh, the decoupling nature of it, and then now I have to uh, basically tell you what what binds these things together, right? Uh, so you you cannot have a system that's completely decoupled with everything doing uh, whatever it wants to do. So what is what is the mechanism that sort of uh, rules them all or binds them together, right? Uh, the uh, the the Key principle here is what is called a queryable timestamp, right? So the queryable timestamp is is the is the control mechanism, if you will, that actually keeps these different components actually working together with a common purpose of aligning Napa's performance with the client expectation, right? So um, the later I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, uh, talk more about it in the sense that the uh, your ingestion and storage are basically pushing the system in very different directions, right? One is actually making things worse for uh, the user. One is actually making things for better. Like ingestion is making worse, storage is doing uh, things making better. And now QT is the control mechanism. Uh, that's actually, interestingly, that's in uh, Indrajit's team that is actually uh, constantly trying to stay correct the state of the system. Right. So for now, uh, just the keyword queryable time time is sufficient. I'm just going to move on with the remainder of the talk. All right. Now, um, this is uh, roughly uh, Napa's architecture. You, you can actually spot the three boxes, um, uh, the ingestion, the query serving, and the storage and indexing, right? That is one part of it that forms the data plane of Napa. Uh, you can also see our familiar ETL uh, pipeline that's actually bringing in data. Now, what, what we built on top of it is actually a control plane, um, which uh, consists of a controller uh, and the queryable timestamp, which uh, is, uh, uh, is is the signal by which these three components can be controlled. Now, uh, what the QT or the control uh, queryable timestamp does is that it actually we use it to orchestrate work and maintain the database at client requirement. So um, this is the control uh, system. This is the input of the control system, and this is what the control system uses in order to actually maintain the database at the right uh, optimal level for the client. Okay, now um, uh, briefly on uh, the ingestion, let's go one by one. Uh, the ingestion uh, is, uh, the, the, the first thing about ingestion is that you your goal as an ingestion system is to basically ingest data as quickly as you can, right? You don't want to hold on to the data. You, you want to quickly get the data in, you want to acknowledge and you want to give um, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of guarantees on the data that is actually ingested. So what we do is we quickly take the data, we actually replicate it, then we commit and then we acknowledge. Right, and we actually give a timestamp and things like that. Now, um, the goal of the ingestion is very simple: go as quickly as you can. Uh, don't block the ingestion pipeline, right? To 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 the extent possible. All right. Now, um, then what you do, right? So, note that uh, you might have something like a conflicting goal here, right? The ingestion's goal is to quickly write data out so that you can actually unblock uh, ingestion, right? So, uh, what happens is that the output of the uh, of the ingestion server is right optimized, right? So basically, if you, if you query it, it'll, it'll be terrible. Now, what you need is a background operation that will make this thing into something that's read optimized or that is great for query, right? So the key idea there is uh, something very familiar. It's called the log structured merge tree. And that is a data structure or that is a mechanism that we actually use in order to um, uh, organize the ingested data. Right now, um, the, the 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 caveat here is that um, of course there is no free lunch here, right? So uh, the minute you have something like an LSM, you're talking about um, uh, you have to pay the cost of reading and writing multiple times, and that's popularly called a write amplification, right? So, but the, one of the things you will actually see here is that the um, LSM is um, nicely tied in uh, to many of things we do, um, including uh, we use the property of the LSM to achieve uh, robust query performance. All right. Now, um, let me show you uh, the, the, how the whole thing works. Uh, uh, the, the, the previous slide pictorially, the ingestion uh, server brings in, it actually uh, dumps in these uh, tiny uh, uh, sort of uh, um, files on um, our, our file system. 
right and then uh, one of the things i already told you that uh, this part of it is uh, uh, right optimized it's not for query you cannot really query this data if you query it your performance will be terrible because the yield from opening every single of these files is quite low now what happens is that uh, we there is a background process that is actually taking these small things and building out larger and larger um, 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 files called deltas Right. So um, the one of the things you can immediately see here is that the process is called compaction, uh, where we actually take these small uh, deltas and actually make them into larger ones. Now, the things you see in green are uh, read optimized, and it is for query. Right. Now, uh, some of you might have actually noticed that that basically means that um, whatever is ingested cannot be immediately queried. So there is going to be a lag in terms of what is available for query. Right. And, and um, that turns out is the key idea behind queryable timestamp right now this is an important concept so basically uh, if you look, give me a database there is a queryable timestamp of the database or a table um, uh, or a view if you will where we basically say that it's a live marker it's constantly changing this is the point to which you can actually query the database it is typically a few minutes in the past and if you query at that particular data at that particular point we actually give you a lot of nice properties so what we say here is that um, the if you query at, at that particular timestamp, the all the views and tables are consistent, right? It doesn't matter whether your query touches a, a table or it touches a view of the table, it's going to be consistent. The second thing that we actually say here is that the, the query will end up reading a, a very small number of deltas. We bound the number of um, uh, deltas that you will end up reading. So this is where the the um, the decoupling comes, right? Regardless of the state of the system, you can actually the query ends up reading a fixed number of these deltas, which actually is very good for tail mitigation, as our external results will show. Third thing is that these um, uh, deltas are now available in a quorum of data centers, which basically means that you have more option of reading from a local data center as, as opposed to a really far data center. So now the QT is um, is basically the the sweet spot, right? Uh, of where if you query, you're going to get really good performance on the database or the table, right? And um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we actually control this QT and, and uh, we use it to give um, the client the desired performance. Uh, the, so the, the gist is that maybe this is the next slide. Hey, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, yeah, you had a question? Uh, it's, it's the number of deltas that need to be read for any query is less than X. That, that, that assumes your, your index, your, your ingestion component is can, can process them as fast as possible, right? If you fall behind, then you can't guarantee that, right? Sure. You, you cannot, yes. So I, I think you're, you're, you're explaining that in the next slide. Yes, I, I'm going to put it All right, sorry. All right, now, um, so uh, let, let's look at uh, this particular slide, right? Now, now uh, the, the QT basically, uh, like Andy said, uh, rightly you said, that uh, the QT basically decide what you can query. Right, the, the 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 it is fixed at uh, at a certain number or it's bounded by some number, right? Uh, the, 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 the there are some subtleties to it. Obviously, we, we don't uh, want to talk too much about it, right? Now, um, the so one of the things that you can actually see here is that uh, the QT also means uh, freshness delay, right? Um, so one of the now you can immediately see there is something going on here. There is a push and pull that is going on here, which is perfect for a control system, right? Let me tell, show you the push and pull that's going on here. Right now, the ingestion. If you ingest more, and you are, or if you, if you, um, um, if you um, push a lot of data, you actually make the span lesser. Right? You make the data inherently stale. On the other hand, um, if you um, increase the number of views, you make pushing in this uh, the other direction much harder. Right? Um, so the indexing uh, indexing effort reduces the span, but also if you add more views uh, or or things like that, it actually makes um, uh, the pushing QT in the right hand side much harder. Now, the client query always has fixed work. Right Now, what it basically means is here's a system that is being pushed in left direction, right direction, there's a constraint. And, and now that makes for a very perfect system, right? Because now what, there is a control system with, with enormous amount of control that it, it can decide which table to work on, uh, what, to, what work to schedule. Um, uh, and then it, it looks at the reference client requirements and basically says that I'm going to maintain um, the table based on this particular requirement that the client has given me. The one measure that actually tells me if I'm doing well or not is this QT. 
right? Because QT says the client uh, the client performance is good. QT uh, talks about um, the, the 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 QT way. If you can maintain QT, it means the cost is low. So you can actually see that we actually build a very nice control system on top of it that will maintain this thing against the required spec. Okay, now uh, let's look at uh, things slightly more um, uh, pictorially, right? So you can go back to our old three clients, external framework, the fresh analytics, and the external uh, facing uh, client. One of the things you can actually see here is that the, the the what is actually encoded is what is actually provisioned or some amount of indexing, some amount of ingestion, some amount of indexing, some amount of cost, right? And what is actually uh, again fixed is what is the maximum span we got to allow that basically says how much is the querying performance on this particular database. Now, what the Q controller does is it takes all these specs into mind and it takes the physical running system, um, the performance of the running system, the current characteristics of the system, and it's actually able to reconcile one against the other. And, and that is how we are able to maintain um, uh, uh, databases at the right performance. So one of the things I'm going to show you in the next several slides is that um, later at, at, towards the end of the talk is I'm going to show you these clients and I'm going to, I'm going to show you actual graphs from production tracers so that you can actually see how we do these things. All right. Are there any questions here before I actually move on to some of the infrastructure related problems? All right. Perfect. All right. Now, um, the other uh, sort of um, the, uh, the thing that is actually very different about uh, Napa, uh, Napa is that the we use uh, a, a database system called F1 Query as our infrastructure both for maintaining uh, tables and views and actually also for client serving uh, needs. Now, what that basically means is that this database uh, engine F1 query um, has to be good at two very different kinds of workload, right? In the first kind of workload, you're talking about an enormous data volumes, the terabytes, petabytes, if you will, of data um, that uh, you would have to transform uh, a, from some input representation to some output representation. Right. Now, um, F1 query um, um, was modified in order to take advantage or, 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 or be very good at this kind of a workload. What is F1 query has been traditionally good is uh, serving clients uh, with a sub-second latency. So that is uh, something that uh, we um, that it, it has been built for. And one of the things we actually augmented to it is the ability to actually serve these queries with minimal tails. So that is the other uh, changes we did. So using the same infrastructure, both for um, like modifying the tables and views as well as this client query serving is actually one of the, um, I, I think, uh, um, thing that we did in F1 query, which I'm very personally very proud of. Now, um, so we, when it comes to the indexing thing, there are basically two kinds of workloads that we do. One is um, a compaction, which basically is, it takes an input LSM, it uh, takes a span of the input LSM, it actually merges and updates the LSM. And uh, the uh, view generation, which is basically, it takes uh, the root tables LSM, it sorts, group by, aggregates, and actually updates the view LSM, right? And then um, note that we are not talking about trivial amounts of data, but rather we're talking about enormous volumes of data that is actually flowing through these query plans. Right. Now, um, the and, and uh, if you look through it, I mean, in some sense, you have this ingestion server, you have this root table, and then you have these views, and what you can actually see here is that it's almost um, the update flows from one LSM to another LSM, creating these forest of uh, LSMs. Um, and uh, a, a root table can update a view, a view can, uh, and a, a view can update another view, and so on. Um, the uh, so what you can see here, and all these things have been done in bounded time. And obviously, the 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 um, the uh, so the the data volumes and the sort of the latencies on these things are pretty stiff. Right. Now, uh, let me briefly talk to you about challenges, right? Um, one of the challenges here is that when you merge, you know that um, as a fan in uh, becomes wider and wider, you become more susceptible to tails, right? Uh, so the reason for that is that there could be one uh, slow uh, input that could actually slow down the entire query. So that, that is problematic, right? And, and especially because these are ordered merges, uh, which basically means that you can really skip a particular uh, input. Now, when it comes to view generation, you're talking about petabytes worth of data. So basically, you have to be very careful about um, how you uh, preserve uh, orders, right? Uh, when, when you say orders, it means sorting, partitioning, uh, if you're clustering information, and things like that, right? Now, uh, you, what one has to be careful um, uh, here is that the uh, 
creating these new uh, kind of sort order is ex extremely expensive so you want to avoid that so you don't you never want to destroy sort and then and we also have uh, things where you can actually partially reuse sorts and things like that so it's a very nice um, sort of an interesting take on interesting orders actually um, that we have done here now the issues here which we didn't talk in uh, enormous details are uh, we are very interested in sort efficiencies in data skews runtime uh, tails and so on Okay, now um, let me go to query serving then. So uh, the goal here, uh, just to recall, is to serve uh, queries, these queries fast, and also to make sure that uh, they are uh, the, the query performance is robust. So one of the first thing we actually did is uh, we introduced a new sort of um, uh, service that sits between our uh, worker and the raw storage. Right. So now the uh, this um, caching, uh, this uh, layer does aggressive caching and many kinds of optimization. Right. So um, the uh, so the uh, the key idea here is that the you if you actually want a piece of data and then if you have to fetch the data from disk, uh, that incurs an enormous amount of uh, latency. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the F1 worker when it reads. It is actually reading something that is uh, cached in one of the many layers that we have in this particular system. Right. Now, um, let me talk at a very high level here. The, the common fallacy that people have here is that if you throw more parallelism at a problem, you can actually solve it. right? But the issue there is that the more the parallelism you can actually throw at a problem, the more you sort of magnify the tails. Now, now, now uh, let me give an example for that. Um, think about thousand. You you use thousand workers to uh, read a piece of data, and uh, what immediately happens is that the ninety nine point nine nine percentile tail um, now gets magnified and appears as a ninety percentile. Right. So the more the parallelism you throw, the more you are at the mercy of these tails. Now um, that that is that is one uh, common uh, sort of uh, design problem with with uh, with, uh, with many systems is that the the there is the parallelism basically goes completely uncontrolled, right? And and this is important to understand that parallelism is not necessarily a great thing if you are very worried about tails. How do you sort of mitigate it? Let me just talk about three things. But uh, if you look at the paper, there is there is a whole laundry list of very different techniques we use here. One thing here is that if you actually end up uh, not touching the the base table, but rather if you touch uh, the the views, um, immediately you don't have need that much amount of parallelism because the data is already done for you. The data is already been reduced for you. It is much more consumable than um, uh, what you would have had had you touched the base table. The other thing to keep in mind here is that all these things are great idea. Like push down filters is a great idea. Caching is a great idea. Um, so those are all very good at. Um, actually, uh, uh, reducing the data access and and which in turn reduces the um, the uh, the tails. Now you can also uh, sort of redu uh, uh, remove unnecessary parallelism. For example, you can combine small IOs. You, you can make one single IO. Um, you can do better allocation of things. You can actually cluster them in the physical storage so that uh, you don't have to um, spawn completely different threads. Right. And the final thing is um, you you basically accept the fact that you're going to have tails. And uh, you basically do some mitigation around it, right? So one of the things you can detect early, you can restart, you can offer competing ones. So at the, the big challenge with NAPA, as you can see here, is that the, uh, the tail abation and robust query processing forms one key challenge of NAPA. And we had to go through many, many of these techniques. We had to implement uh, an enormous amount of techniques before we could actually abate tails to an extent that we can actually make the system quite robust to query. So which, I mean, of the architectures that you showed before uh, in the previous slide, which ones do you guys actually control, right? Because the F1 was an existing infrastructure, right? Uh, and then Colossus is is also existing infrastructure. And, and like, are you guys, when you, so when you list these things, these the optimizations you guys apply, are you sure about that, you, that you modified NAPA to, to produce, you know, the amount of IO you're doing? Right, so which is why the, the middle layer is important. The middle layer is completely our software. Uh, so the reads are not done by the F1 worker, but rather it's delegated to this uh, intermediate uh, service that actually does the read for us. So, which basically means that we can control the caching story, we can control the parallelism story, uh, we, we, we can prefetch, we can do a lot of those tricks. 
um, uh, in in that particular layer. So if you had the F1 worker directly read uh, the raw storage, then obviously we are at the mercy of the tails, right? We couldn't do any any of these things. Okay, just be very clear. So to be very clear, like Colossus as as Napa uses it is unmodified, or maybe you guys told him, hey, fix okay. these things, but it's not source code that you guys made here. But that's right. No, Colossus as Napa uses unmodified, completely unmodified. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to the present, uh, the performance uh, results, some experimental results. Is there any other questions before I move on? You're doing okay on time. You have, you know, 17 minutes. Yeah, I, I do, yes. All right, okay. Now, um, let me uh, 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 talk to you a little bit about uh, performance uh, traces. Um, I'm going to show you a few um, rather high-level um, um, figures. Um, the What I'm going to show you... Um, obviously, or um, some simple experiments that actually show you a few th different things. One is that targeted view results in better query performance. No surprises there. Um, the larger um, uh, fan-in basically means that you are at the mercy of tails. Uh, and then the, the, the interesting one, uh, to me at least, is that I can show you that different clients can realize their uh, desired uh, trade-offs. And finally, how decoupling is, is a good idea. Okay, So the, that's the basic agenda here. And um, uh, let me just walk you through it. All right, so, um, he, he, so here is a real workload. Uh, and then the goal is um, we, we basically wanted to figure out how many uh, uh, views you can throw in on um, before uh, we can actually uh, the, make the uh, um, completely cover the workload so that uh, every query hits a view, right? So one of the things that you can actually uh, see here is that it took about eight views for us to get to that sweet spot. And one of the things uh, that, that's actually noticeable here is that, that the 99th percentile, which is the yellow bar, actually benefits from uh, views, right? For the mere reason that you mentioned before that um, the if you read from a view, less parallelism is needed, which basically means that you are less at the mercy of the tail. So that there is some tail abatement that is going on if you have more views in your system. All right. Now, um, the other one is um, what happened? Like, yes. Like for, for the previous slide, like, like, what is the order in which you're adding the views? Right? Is like the view, like you know, you, you go over one, two, three, four, six, up to ten, up to eight. Like, is are they sorted or is it random? Like, is the one view that could have the most impact? You know, did you did you add that first? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think we just went to the number of query templates on, on uh, so okay. the, the first view that got added is the one with the most query template binding to it. Okay, all right. Uh, right. All right. So, um, the, so the second one we want to show you here is that um, if you're increasing the merge ways, uh, one of the things that you can actually see here is that the tail increases fairly rapidly. So you can look at the 99th percentile. Um, the You can see that uh, it increases at a much faster clip than the 90th percentile or the 50th percentile. So the tail is very sensitive to the the, the number of things you need to merge while answering queries, and and that is um, uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, the bounding the the number of uh, the, the the QT bounding the number of deltas you need to merge in query time is such a good idea. So uh, you, for our very high performance system, we actually keep uh, that number fairly tight so that you don't have to really merge enormous amount of data on the fly. Okay, now um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trade-offs, right? Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the, I'm going to go back to our old uh, clients, the three clients, and actually show you some production data. Uh, and then um, the, for, and I'm going to show you that the clients really got what they needed, right? Okay, now um, the what I what you see is a graph with four panels to it, right? The first one is the ingestion rate in some units, um, the data delay in some other units, query latency, and resource cost, right? Um, and then what you see are three curves, right? There's a blue curve, there's a red curve, and there's a, um, a, a yellow curve, right? Now the so this is the uh, the first one is the uh, the blue curve. I'm just looking at the blue curve now. That's our experimental framework. Um, it pumps in an enormous amount of data, uh, which you can see from the top panel. Um, the uh, It gets reasonably good performance, as you can see from the third panel. And you can actually see that the cost is quite low. I mean, uh, considering how much data they push in, they, they don't pay that much of a cost. Now, one of the things they actually gave up was the freshness. So they, they don't get a tremendous amount of freshness. 
but that is fine now if you if they wanted better freshness obviously the cost would would actually balloon up quite a bit right now uh, let's look at the second um, uh, the curve which is the the red curve this is the uh, analytical uh, tool that wanted um, uh, that had a moderate ingestion as you can see from the first one it um, they got uh, moderate freshness on the data um, the for the cost they paid that's what they get and from the last curve that you can see that they got low cost now one of the things they actually gave up was the performance their performance is actually worse than the previous one now uh, this is a, a, a state in which they're quite happy with so this is obviously they arrived it from after much trial and error and then they're happy with this particular state they're happy with the cost they pay they're happy with uh, their the freshness they get and they're happy with the performance okay and this is this thing works for them now tomorrow they could come back and actually change all of this okay they could change uh, every aspect of it but at that moment when the screenshot was taken they, they this is their state okay now the final thing is our all important um, uh, external uh, client as you can see here is that they 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 uh, they don't ingest that uh, tremendous amount of data um, they they get super high freshness they are really high performant i mean they are super high performant the cost is also high for the amount of data they ingest uh, they, you can see that they pay a tremendous amount of cost again they they are um, they they are very happy with this particular setup and nothing stops them from changing them tomorrow so as you can see here that clients can come to napa they can specify the constraint they want and to a large extent they can actually get what they want they 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 go through a trial and error process and they actually actually converge at something that actually suits their business state and the nice thing about napa is that nothing is set in stone you can actually come back and change it yet again and that is perfectly fine with us and we built a system that is actually able to cater hundreds of these clients constantly changing the requirements every um, every day that there is perfectly fine the system is able to handle it and that's i believe makes napa such a powerful idea for what we do right now finally i'm going to show uh, you that uh, the decoupling is 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 perfect right it's it, it actually is is the right idea here now what you see here is the familiar uh, four panes you see an ingestion and then you see some indexing performance and then you see some uh, freshness and then you some you see some uh, query latency now in the second pane what i have shown you is there is some infrastructure problem and the indexing is not moving now what happens is that um, the while the indexing ramps up and the, the the one of the things you can actually see here there is a brief hit in the data delay but the query latency is is rock solid right i mean it's not it's not budged at all it is actually giving perfectly good performance the dashboards are all working except that the outage is actually manifested as some freshness delay for a brief period of time now when the indexing ramps up um, you can actually see that the freshness is abated and things go back to normal the going back to the napa architecture you can actually see that there are two things in action here the mere fact that we decouple these things basically means that they can actually go in their own pace and the second fact that we actually put a controller on top of it actually means that the system can constantly correct itself in, and and you can you can it it comes to a point um, it it might have occasional outages like every other system but can now automatically correct itself the controller can correct itself it can invest more resources than needed and actually bring the system back into a point that is in alignment with the client performance and the most important thing here is that there was no dashboard outages all the dashboard work except that obviously it'll see um, a little bit of stale data which is also bounded right so there is also an sla on it that is also bounded and we'll never let the system go beyond that particular level okay all right now i'm going to summarize and then i am happy to take um, um, more questions right now um, napa is a system that is enormously scalable it's um, uh, it it has a tremendous high query workload we handle billions and billions of queries we take an, a massive amount of uh, uh, data volumes we are uh, um a very important uh, data warehouse inside uh, google now what is very unique about napa is that we actually um, um use materialized views to achieve subsequent uh, queries the materialized views are hundreds and thousands uh, we maintain them consistently despite uh, ingesting trillions and trillions of rows and the um, and the clients have the flexibility to uh, change the data freshness query latency and cost now the way we built napa is that we have actually built in ample opportunities for automation tuning and self driven um, query efforts the controller is one aspect of it 
but there are many very nice interesting sort of uh, uh, automatic tuning problems that, that, that are present in, in NAPA, many of which we actually solved, but don't discuss in the paper. So we'll discuss them in a future work. So that's that's pretty much all I had. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, great. So I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Um, so we have actually 10 minutes or so for questions. So if you have a question for Jagan, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and fire away. Otherwise, I'll be selfish and I'll just ask all my questions. OK, all right. So all right, let's fire away. Um, so the, the QTs. QT is the main sort of interface that you're exposing or the knob you're exposing to the users, right? That allows them to control the, the love triangle, the freshness versus cost versus performance, right? Um, it, like, are people able to wrap their heads around that? Like, because you just tell them what, you, you get this query in five five minutes of freshness, like, or is it like a, is it a dial you, or something you, you expose them? No, so um, th there is a difference between um, uh, sort of stating your expectation from a database versus the current state of the database. Right? QT yeah. is the current state of the database. It basically tells right. you, um, I, I am able to fulfill all your needs, um, the, all your requirements on 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 uh, that you imposed on me, but I'm able to only do it, uh, say, on, on a timestamp that is, say, seven minutes away, right? I mean, it, it, it still says that it basically this one the unit uh, tells you um, many things, right? It tells you that um, I haven't met your needs. Uh, whatever you told me, I'm able to uh, achieve that. But the only thing is, I'm able to give you something that's only seven minutes away. Now, you can look at it and basically say that, um, uh, yes, seven minutes is fine for my application needs. Or you can basically come back to us and say that, no, that is unacceptable. I never want the database to go more than three minutes, right? So I'm just throwing some random numbers at you. Yeah, but there are, there are two things to uh, sort of uh, reconcile here, right? There is one aspect of it where is the, the client actually um, says what the expectation from the database is that is actually codified in the system itself. The QT is the manifestation of that expectation, but it actually tells you very succinctly that the performance can be only achieved at a certain time, right? I mean, um, right. I mean, obviously you would not be happy if it came back to you and said that um, I'm able to meet all your demands, but the QT is two hours high, right? And so there is some, you can sort of understand that how QD nicely, uh, very succinctly sort of conveys many, many things and is a great way of actually building a control system over it. No, 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 I'm curious because it's like, um, you know, a lot of times in systems we say, we, you know, we say, well, expose something to the client and let them tell us what they want. But clients, people are stupid, right? They don't, they don't know how to, to, you know, describe certain things. Um, so I, I like this approach, but it sounds like also too that like maybe you said this during your talk and maybe this is just a, a slip up or you made it this exact, but it sounds like someone can change what they want the freshness to be on a day by day basis, not on, not on like a query by query basis. Right, right. Obviously, but if you change, then uh, everything changes, right? The cost profile changes, yeah. the, every, everything yeah. other changes, right? So almost like um, uh, we, we've hit upon something uh, I think very fundamental here, which is that you, uh, the love triangle, as you described it, you you can choose two sides of it, right? But you are you are completely unbounded on the third one, right? I mean, the third one is what the system basically says it can or cannot do, uh, yeah. right? So it, you can come back and say my freshness is, should be three seconds, obviously, but there's a cost to pay for it, right? So the the, the client basically uh, has to figure out what the three numbers that make sense for them, right? They can specify two, but you're to, you're to the mercy of the third, right? So I, I'm not sure I can answer your question, but uh, no, it, it, yeah, I was just curious, like, like it's, but the, the, a client, a Google internal clients do this on a day by day basis. They, they, they don't obviously, uh, they, they, day by day would be a little uh, too aggressive, but they have the option of doing it very often, right? Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay. Um, what is the, um, what does your merge delta file format look like? Is that something like Parquet or is that in, like, is it like a sort of column store or is it something? Yeah, it's a column Google? store. Database, yes, it is. Yeah, and, and, store. And, and proprietary Google. And proprietary Google, yes. Okay. How aggressive are you doing compression in that? Pretty aggressive. Oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, can't say anymore. Okay. Um, how complex are your are your materialized views? Like, do, you, do you support joins, left adder joins? Like the, I guess the follow-up is how are you actually maintaining them? 
are you doing like just recompeting the query from scratch? Probably not because that would be expensive. But are you doing like the incremental updates? Yeah, it's, it's to... all, all incrementally updated. Uh, I, I think in this paper, we don't talk about joins. Um, but uh, they, every, everything is incrementally maintained. And uh, the, the, the goal is to be, if you are not super efficient, I don't think you can really keep up with the, the amount of data we are actually pumping into the system. So um, efficiency uh, uh, in every dimension is quite, it's quite important. I mean, attention to detail is very important in what we do. So, Of course. And then I understand that like, your, your third bullet point here says there's a bunch of automated stuff you've done that you can't describe just now. Um, but it, I mean, at some point, I think the, I guess the question is like, how complex are the queries that are, are, you, are you handling? Is it sort of, you know, is it like in the scale like TPC DS or very, you know, very complex? No, uh, no, no, not super complex, right? Uh, because the, these okay. are uh, board queries. Um, and you, um, the other thing also you have to keep in mind is that there are ample opportunities of observing a query way beforehand and, and sort of creating um, sort of views that align with those queries, right? I mean, you're not talking about like random ad hoc queries or not our predominant use case here. You're talking about dashboards with well-established query patterns that you have ample opportunities to plan for and build uh, views on top, right? That does not mean that there are not opportunities for quickly responding um, uh, self-tuning kind of uh, uh, view designs, right? I mean, opportunities like that do exist. But simple heuristics are probably good enough because you're seeing the same query templates over and over again. I, I, because, okay. yeah. I, I think you have a few uh, hands that are raised, I think. Oh, sorry, I missed that. All right, Tatanga, go for it. Hey, Jorgen, this is Tatanga. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey. Hey, interesting paper. Uh, thanks for presenting it. I was wondering about uh, the utility of the distributed cache, how much that you see the distributed cache is being used, and how much of a variance that you see the queries that are hitting the distributed caches versus that are going directly to material SPS. Right. Um, so um, see that the, the, the I, I think the 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 the, the nice uh, um, the, the the comparison between I think the local cache and distributed cache I think makes a, a tremendous uh, difference right um, a, a local cache is obviously high performant and smaller um, uh, a, a, a distributed um, uh, uh, cache is larger um, but but uh, you have to make a network hop right I mean so I would I would sort of put them together as uh, more complementary to each other. Like uh, think of distributed cache as a slightly less performant cache, but you can have a really large one as opposed to a local cache. Um, materialized views um, is, I think, a slightly orthogonal here. Right? What you cache doesn't really matter, right? You could cache, um, you could you could actually cache uh, tables. You could cache uh, views. Uh, right? It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, well, did I answer your question? I'm sorry. Uh, Oh yes, thanks, Jagan. I think uh, I was con confused. I was thinking that uh, the distributed cache is using for one purpose, like all always caching the uh, the res results of a query that has been previously issued. But no, no, no. The, the views actually exist beforehand, right? Yeah. So uh, that, that, obviously that is possible. That's a, that's a pretty nice uh, way to do things, but uh, not, not not the focus here. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next is a mole, which I think you should know. Oh, yes, of course. Very well. Hi, Jagan. Uh, so oh, actually, yeah. my question was partially addressed, but uh, let me ask it again. So what is the, uh, so there's, there's two questions. One is you talked about cost a lot. And I was curious, like, or is this something that they actually, is it actual cost that the, uh, the, the customer is paying you somehow internally? Or uh, is it just like a number? Uh, yes, I mean, we have fairly sophisticated ways of measuring cost, right? I mean, we, we um, and, uh, and uh, charging uh, users and so on, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, yes, I mean, there is a real cost and everything and everything we do uh, is, is actually uh, charged, right? So uh, the, uh, although the units of cost may not make a lot of sense outside uh, Google, but uh, inside Google, there's, there's a, that's a very well-developed kind of uh, semantics of cost. Right, so that the team that's asking for these reports, they're actually paying in some sort of dollars that they care about. Some units, yes, absolutely, right, yeah. yeah. I guess the second question was like, you know, I was just trying to browse through your paper, but what is the subset of SQL that you do support in this thing? Like this sort of follow-ups up on Andy's question earlier on what queries you support and what you don't. I, I think pretty much industry standard, right? I mean, no, I, I don't think our SQL is deficient in any, any sense. Um, in, in, in uh, yeah, so um, pretty much. Uh, it's the standard Google SQL dialect that you guys are 
pushing out as open source, right? That's right. Yeah. I, I, I think I, it, I, it, yeah, go ahead, uh, Amol. I was just curious about the incremental maintenance part of it, right? Is that something that you sort of had to innovate in or were you able to use mostly standard techniques there? Um, so the I think the the uh, in terms of I think uh, the literature I think whatever uh, the literature provides us in terms of the algebraic mechanics that is needed to maintain abuse uh, for most part I think we could find uh, things for the literature but what was really challenging right. is uh, how do you make these things work uh, at at scale and at the consistency guarantees that are uh, that are needed right so that those two things were quite uh, challenging. So we, we do have some more publication uh, in, in the works that talks more about uh, the view maintenance and the associated challenges. Oh, cool. Look forward to that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any last question? So, I mean, it's not, it's, they're completely different architectures, but like, and they're solving different problems, like BigQuery versus, versus uh, Napa, right? Because you're trying to do more real-time-ish things and BigQuery is, is more of a you know, yeah. traditional style data warehouse. But I guess um, maybe focus on, on the predecessor of Napa would be Mesa. Like what's one thing that you guys have found that you're able to do with Napa that you weren't able to easily do with, with Mesa? Oh, okay. So um, I, I should say, where do we start, right? The, so uh, one one aspect of it is this, right? So, um, uh, so think about um, uh, let's see. So Mesa belonged to a style of um, of data warehouse where you did everything at the ingest. So the ingest and ing indexing were basically coupled with each other. Um, so uh, one thing about Mesa was that if you threw in a lot of these views, um, you you basically have a freshness problem. So basically your database will get slower and slower and slower as you increase the number of views. Um, the second aspect of it is that um, the decoupling, um, uh, it's slightly unintuitive, but uh, think about this, that the mere fact that we decouple and the mere fact that we have these aggressive sort of consistency models basically means that I can actually slip in views. Um, and, and the fact that views are completely hidden from the user basically means that I can actually slip in views, I can remove views without actually affecting the inquiries. None of these things uh, the, the Mesa could actually do. So uh, we made architectural changes when you actually also made these automation changes and, and we actually removed the binding between uh, the user or we completely hid away the views, which basically meant that Napa could do many of these things fairly easily that Mesa could not do. Um, and obviously uh, the, uh, in terms of query performance and things like that, obviously this one is much, much, much uh, high performant than uh, uh, Mesa, but, but that, that is understandable because Mesa, Napa is a fairly new system. So. Okay, awesome. All right. So again, I will applaud uh, on behalf of everyone else. Thank you so much, Jagan, so uh, Indurit, and Hakan for being with us today. Thank you.